Okay, well, I think in the interest of being timely, we'll go ahead and get started here and knowing that others may be kind of joining in as we go along. Um, but thank you all for joining us today. Um, I thought we'd start with just a brief introduction of some of the people facilitating um, here today. So I'm Brittany Summers. Um, I'm a psychologist at Cleveland State University and also in a group practice in Beechwood, Ohio. Um, and I am the chair of OPA's Early Career Committee. Um, and so glad to be able to help facilitate this. I know training concerns have been top of mind at Cleveland State, and we've definitely heard a lot in OPA's discussions as well. So um, we know that COVID has caused a lot of concerns on a lot of different levels, and one of those where it's really impacting is training right now. Um, so we're happy to have this space where both training directors from some of the Ohio internships and some of the academic programs can join us here today. Um, I'm going to have uh, Adrian, who's also facilitating, introduce herself and then also just some of OPA's response um, to the pandemic. Sure. Um, my name is Adrian Jett. I'm a psychologist at the Columbus VA. Um, I'm also um, co-chair of the OPA membership committee. Um, and I know on the membership committee, we've been talking Can you hear, are you able to hear me? Yeah. No. Oh, 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 okay, okay. I'm done, Michael, if, I don't know if you wanted to say any introductions at all. Oh, we didn't hear most of what you said, so. Oh, you didn't. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, okay. Um, I'm Adrian Jett. I am um, co-chair of membership committee for OPA. Did y'all hear that part? <laughs> okay, good. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I was just saying that on membership committee, we've been talking for a long time about reaching out to training directors um, and leaders in academic training departments. And so we're really thrilled to have all of you together today um, and hope to be reaching out to you all a lot more in the future about upcoming um, things for your students and also um, ways for us to get together um, as a community. So thank you for joining us. We also have on this call president-elect of OPA, Cindy Van Curen, and Michael Rainey, who's our executive director. So certainly, if we have questions throughout about OPA's response, we've got some well-equipped people, and you can hear a little bit more about how the supports OPA has. Um, but we're also really excited to have Dr. Kathy Gruss join us. Um, and so I wanted to introduce her a little bit here. Uh, Dr. Gress is the Chief Education Officer at APA and has been on staff at APA since 2005. She was named Deputy Executive Director of Education in 2010. In her role as Chief Education Officer, she leads the association's efforts to promote psychology and education and education in psychology. She has played a lead role in the association's efforts related to advancing interprofessional education for psychology students, primary care psychology practice, development of models and tools for competency assessment, and supervision. She serves on APA as APA's representative to the National Academy of Medicine's Global Forum on Innovations in Health Professions Education, the Interprofessional Professionalism Collaborative, and the Federation of Associations of Schools of the Health Professions. Before coming to APA, she was an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Miami School of Medicine, where she served as the director of an APA accredited internship program. She is the recipient of many awards, including the Paul Nelson Award, the Friend of the Association of Directors of Psychology Training Clinics, and the Novo University Distinguished Alumni Achievement Award. And in 2016, she was in her inducted into the National Academies of Practice as a Distinguished Scholar and Fellow. So we're so glad to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us to help facilitate some of these questions. Um, and I think to start us off, you were going to uh, just talk through a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation on APA's response as a starting point for our discussion today. Yeah, thank you very much for that introduction, Brittany. And I'm going to just very briefly 
uh, share a little bit about what APA has been doing. But I'm really excited about the opportunity for us to have a conversation as a group because I have to say that many of the things that APA has done has, has been a collaboration with other training directors. And your experiences are, are extremely helpful at this point in time because no one entity has the answers here because we are living through uncharted uh, conversations as we, we move through this uh, crisis. So with that, I'm going to pull this up. Okay. And again, I just want to give you a high-level um, overview of some of the things that we have been doing at the Education Directorate at APA uh, to be responsive to the questions and concerns that we're hearing from the training community. Uh, we've done a variety of, of different types of responses that I'll, I'll walk you through some uh, that might be particularly helpful to you. And just as an aside, if, if people are interested, I'm very happy to share these slides later on because we have embedded a, a lot of hyperlinks in here. So you can go and use some of the resources that might be particularly useful uh, to you that I might mention uh, to you today. Uh, but we've been looking at providing our training community guidance and advice materials, uh, curating FAQ documents. Uh, we've been involved in email, mass email communications and uh, media outreach. Uh, we've created free access to some of our APA electronic resources. We're doing lots of webinars. And we've also been providing some uh, COVID-19 specific um, uh, resources for continuing education opportunities for our practitioner community, but also things that have been useful, I think, uh, for students. So, you know, again, we in the education director are really targeting a really broad range um, of individuals from students to faculty to supervisors students on internship, postdoctoral fellows, institutions. Um, so we really try to address the wide array of stakeholders that are the education directorate community. Um, and, and one commitment we have is that we are, as we get new information, we, we are updating our materials. This is a rapidly evolving landscape. And what we were telling people back in March is, is not always what we want to tell them right now. So. Uh, we do make sure that the materials that we put out there reflect our, our best understanding at any point in time. So to share with you some of the guidance and advice materials that we've uh, put forward, uh, really we've been trying to respond to uh, specific topical areas where people are asking us, hey, we need some more information about this particular subject. So. Some of the things we've, we've curated so far is we have a general advice document for psychology supervisors and trainees on caring for patients during the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, within this document, we, we do talk about navigating that, that a tricky relationship between ensuring that trainees are safe, managing trainee anxiety as they're delivering patient care, uh, whether it's uh, through uh, telehealth and new platforms that they're not used to doing. Um, so some nice tips in that particular document. Uh, managing your student loans during COVID-19 is another document that we've put out. Uh, more recently, we put out some guidance related to options for uh, training students in the psychological assessment area and some principles that training programs might want to um, adhere to as, as you try to think about training that's particularly difficult area at this point in time. Uh, coping with COVID-19 related stress as a student. Um, and uh, we do have a, a broader uh, telehealth guidance document that um, APA put out, primarily curated by our, our folks in, in the practice directorate. But I will uh, point that out to you that we do have a section uh, for each of the states that are in that document that covers questions that's related to supervised trainee telehealth services, so both um, any state-level guidance about trainees providing telehealth services, as well as any guidance related to telesupervision and how that might work in the state. Um, and again, that's another document that we are trying to keep uh, fairly current because we are seeing state-level guidance coming out and, and changing on, on a fairly regular basis. Um, as you can imagine, uh, lots of questions are coming our direction uh, by email, by phone, uh, you named it, so we've been developing frequently asked questions documents to try to address the more commonly occurring questions that uh, people have been uh, raising to our attention. 
Um, again, focusing on the broad stakeholders that are our education uh, constituents. Uh, some of the things I'll highlight to you is we have a general education FAQ document that just covers the gamut from uh, students who have their research disrupted to students have questions about providing clinical services. So it's really, it's a hodgepodge of all things uh, related to graduate education in particular. Um, we have a resource document um, from our Commission on Accreditation uh, that came out uh, a little while ago, uh, providing some guidance to accredited programs about um, how they should proceed in terms of the disruption uh, to training that, that are really occurring at this point in time and, and where um, some of um, our, our standards might have to be a little bit more flexible um, at this point in time. Um, I will just do a quick aside on this. Um, the Commission on Accreditation uh, does have a work group that's continually to, involve, to uh, assess uh, the, the impact of, of the COVID-19 on training programs, and I would suspect that we'll see this FAQ document updated uh, perhaps within the next couple weeks as the landscape has just, again, really changed from, from where I think it was a, a while back to, to really appreciating that it's a very uncertain and perhaps expen extended period of time that we're going to have to be dealing with disruptions uh, to training, uh, to site visits, um, et cetera. And then um, so, some programs also use um, the SciCAS, which is a centralized application system that APA uh, in consultation with another organization we hosted. Um, since we're you know, just about finishing up the application cycle, but we're already looking forward um, to, to the fall when people are starting to think ahead to applying. So um, we have some FAQs that are specific to um, that particular system and how that might look different at this point in time. Uh, certainly communications has been a big part of our strategy. Um, using our resources um, through our email networks that we have uh, to get information out to the training community. And I wanted to put a couple examples out there that you might not think about, but we um, at the Education Directorate uh, not only serve stakeholders at the graduate education level, but uh, we also work with instructors at the undergraduate level as, as well as high school teachers. So um, we've been in touch with those communities to provide them information uh, to help navigate the disruptions that uh, they too have experienced as educators. Um, and certainly um, as opportunities come up, um, we uh, respond to requests from the press to, to understand more uh, what, what have been some of the impacts of the, the pandemic um, on education and training programs. Um, we've been able to provide free access to a variety of our um, electronic academic materials to um, help uh, academic programs, particularly as this programs had to shift pretty rapidly to um, online instruction. So, uh, for, for a time to limited amount of time, we've been able to provide free access to the publication manual. Uh, that's set to expire probably at the end of May. We're, we're working on seeing if we can get that extended, uh, but we work with external entities uh, that manage some of that process, so that's not entirely an APA decision on, on where those deadlines are set. Um, Academic Writer is another electronic platform that um, APA has developed and manages, and we've been able to provide uh, free access to tutorials about that, quick guides on how to use that. Uh, again, for our high school psychology teachers that were really scrambling to uh, develop uh, materials for online education, um, we have a series of over 20 what we call unit lesson plans uh, that high school psychology teachers can just basically pick up and use in their classroom uh, with, with no preparation needed. So uh, we've made those available free to all high school psychology teachers, hoping that they'll use them in their classroom and, and be able to deliver um, what we think is, is high quality instruction uh, for those learners. Um, uh, another platform which is relatively new to APA is it's called PsychLearn. Uh, it's primarily a platform for undergraduate education. Um, but right now, uh, we have two, uh, two materials available in that area. One is um, in research methodology, and the second one is in social psychology. And uh, it's hard to describe this. It really isn't an online textbook, uh, but it's definitely an online resource for instructors. Uh, but it's really uh, 
takes advantage of what we know about best practices related to how people learn. Uh, so it's adaptive. It uses adaptive technology. So as the learner advances through the materials, if there's places that they're really struggling, uh, the program senses that and can provide supplemental resources to help the student uh, get sure that they, they get the constructs that they're supposed to get out of that particular lesson. Uh, and we're rapidly um, amping up to do some other uh, modules in that area uh, to help, again, assist uh, our undergraduate community who has also uh, gone to online instruction. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a, a lot of what we are doing is really in partnership with um, the training community. We, we couldn't do many of these things without uh, those relationships and, and relationships with other key stakeholders um, that, that impact education and training. Uh, one group in particular that um, APA um, helps facilitate their work um, is called the Council of Chairs of Training Council. Um, and that's a horrible acronym, but essentially the, the composition of that group are all the chairs of the various training councils that um, exist um, in health service psychology. So there's a training council for counseling psychology and one for school psychology and so on and so on. Um, so we, we work with that group and that group has been uh, particularly productive um, over the last couple months in, in developing I think some very important resources for um, the training community. Um, but at their urging um, early in March, um, APA in partnership with APIC, the, the uh, Postdoc and Internship Council, the Canadian Psychological Association, and the Association of State and Provincial Psychology Boards, um, we, we developed a joint statement, um, you know, talking about uh, the need for flexibility and, and the regulatory community, which includes both the accreditors and, and the license, licensing boards, need to work together to ensure that the trainees are at the forefront um, so we came up with that, and that's, that's still a statement that's out there that we can point people to, uh, particularly as uh, they might need it for, for advocacy purposes. Uh, we also worked and continue to work very closely with APIC uh, as different issues come up uh, for the internship and uh, postdoctoral training community. Uh, we uh, hosted a co-hosted a webinar with them uh, recently that was really directed towards training directors that uh, we're really struggling to figure out how to navigate um, what type of clinical work was appropriate and what types of settings for trainees and how to, how to advocate for trainees if they were in a setting where trainees were considered essential employees, but, you know, they weren't having the proper safety precautions put into place. So it was really nice uh, Q&A, and, and with that was um, recorded, um, so it's available um, as a continual resource uh, for training programs. Um, as I mentioned, the CCTC has been very busy. Um, they developed a statement uh, early in, well, it was mid-March actually, on education and training considerations during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, outlining some key principles that people should keep in mind as they're making decisions about uh, training activities for their students. Um, so a useful one, I think, for people to look at. More recently, they've developed a statement in, in response to some um, uh, issues that are coming up with um, uh, particularly postdoctoral fellows uh, being furloughed um, from their programs and providing some guidance on considerations that uh, both programs and organizations should apply when they're making decisions about uh, who to furlough and how that might work and, and what are the, the specific nuances for individuals that are in training programs that need to be handled a little bit differently than uh, somebody who is a, a full-time ongoing regular employee of a particular um, institution. And I will also mention that uh, CCTC is, is currently working on a guidance document for uh, training programs related to how do you make decisions about re reopening? And this is particular to a service delivery. So, it, you know, sending from practicum to internship to, to postdoctoral um, programs as, as we more and more uh, start to, to deliver more services, what should we be mindful of? Um, and again, how do we provide needed clinical care, but do so in a way that, that's appropriate for, for the particular trainees? Mm -hmm. 
We do a lot of webinars uh, for uh, graduate students and early career psychologists. We now have a program of, of webinars called Staying on Track During a Pandemic, where we do weekly, hour-long webinars on topics that we're hearing that uh, there's a strong interest in. And you, you see listed on the bottom here uh, some of the things that we have done and are planning to do. Uh, we have soon we'll be doing one on internship uh, for students on internship and preparing to go on internship. Uh, one for postdocs, um, training and licensure issues. Um, and we did a really cool one last week where uh, we talked about how, uh, how you can defend your thesis from home and, and had a student who actually had recently uh, defended his doctoral uh, dissertation uh, remotely and, and he provided some great tips on how to make that work. Okay. Um, we've also tried to make sure we're reaching out and provide continuing education for um, our, our psychologists, um, making available a number of, of topical programs, offering these uh, free of charge. Uh, some of these are also, I think, uh, appropriate for students. So um, we've really tried to get out to the whole spectrum of the education training community, um, educational resources that um, we feel could be helpful um, to them. And, and I'll highlight the last one on the slide here, right, which I think is um, maybe a, a testament to, you know, really meeting the mark for, for what people need. Um, we offered a, a four-part a series on telepsychology best practices, and uh, we had over 35,000 people uh, sign up for, for that particular series. And, and trust me, uh, that, that is not a typical um, enrollment rate for, for most of our webinars, but we have been seeing across the board that um, our webinars have been um, very well subscribed. People have a lot of interest, so that's something that we'll continue to assess you know, what types of topic areas might, might meet needs in, in our uh, training community. So I'm going to stop uh, on there because I know today's meeting was really more about having a dialogue and a, and a discussion uh, with the training community. Um, I will just highlight two things here before I stop sharing my screen. Um, that is our, our main uh, information page on the APA website. Uh, where you can see all the different types of resources that uh, we have put together. There's a section for education and training. Uh, there's a section for telehealth and telepractice, but there's also resources for parents, for teachers. Um, so we're looking not only at the psychology community, but the, the community at large, which is society and what some of their needs are, and trying to uh, make things available uh, using our psychological science to inform those conversations. And uh, there's my email address um, at the bottom, and I'm, I'm always happy to engage in um, dialogue if people have other questions that, that come up that we might be helpful to you. So, Brittany, I'm going to stop from there and turn it back to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thanks for highlighting all of those resources, um, which I'm sure we have differing levels of familiarity with at this point. Um, so we have about 45 minutes here to open up for questions. I'm thinking we will try with just an open unmute yourself and ask a question format. If that doesn't work, we'll switch to hand raising, but I figure we're a mid-sized group so we can give it a try. Um, and knowing we do want to just be mindful of bouncing questions between both like internship programs and academic programs here since both are represented on the call. We have the questions that you submitted ahead of time. So if we are lacking for questions, we'll try to make sure that those are highlighted as well. So whoever wants to can get us started. You answered all the questions, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed this is a, a, a Zoom phenomenon, I think. <laughs> so I always need one to kick things off, and then people get, get excited to ask questions. <laughs> um, Kathy, I, I'll go I first. Have a question, if I could. Good to see you. Sure, Paula. Doing this. Good I to see you. <laughs> a whole slide set because I was not clever enough to figure out the link. So apologize for that part. So you already answered my question, but... Um, there are, I am really grateful to not be in this particular situation, but there um, are quite a few programs that are having challenges right now with 
students on internship, um, especially internships, some practicum, um, where students are frankly being put in very dangerous situations mm -hmm. and um, told, you know, that if they won't do what they're asked, then goodbye. And I'm wondering, um, I've been trying to brainstorm a little bit in talking to people about these situations, what kind of resources APA and APIC could bring to bear there. Like I know there's the APIC resolution, but um, if that's not effective, it's, it's a really challenging situation, right? Yeah, it is absolutely very challenging, and that's why uh, it's one that we've attended to in a number of different ways, trying to provide um, some guidance because, you know, keeping in mind that, that there's a hierarchical relationship and, um, you know, our trainees are, are not always in a position of, of power within their organizations, and it's even more difficult if you're talking about a doctoral student that's off uh, on internship where you, as a doc training director, um, want to provide some advocacy, but you're removed. Uh, from that as well. Um, so that, that is one of the reasons that we did that webinar with APEC a while back because we too were hearing about um, some of those situations because I think the first uh, line of advocacy, if you will, really rests with, with the training director at that particular site and that, that is part of their responsibility running a training program is to ensure uh, the welfare um, of their trainees and, and to make sure that they're not being put in a physically unsafe environment, but also to make sure that the types of services they're being asked to provide are, are appropriate for their developmental level. I mean, these are scary times. Uh, people are, you know, having their own personal reactions, um, and we're not immune as mental health professionals, and I think we have to recognize that uh, that's a part of the landscape for our students, and, and we need to be, um, you know, protecting that space as well. So, you know, the, there's the CCTC statement, the APIC statement, the, the webinar, those are all things that we've tried to, to put out there to, to give some guidance. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky role when you talk about the, the doctoral program trying to um, navigate things with the internship program because you do have that relationship between the internship and the program uh, that was created vis-a-vis -vis the match process. But um, I, I think ultimately you can be advocates by you know, speaking um, with the internship sites and, and maybe helping empower a training director that might not feel empowered um, to do something. I think a related, a related part, thank you for that. Um, I mean, basically everyone's just in a really hard position, right? And some of these internship training directors are fairly powerless in this situation also. Yeah. Um, I think a related point that we've been really grappling with um, is that students who to date have not required any kinds of accommodations or accessibility mm -hmm. services in the present time may have differing needs. And um, some of those could, or could be on our campus and some of them could be on internship or in other kinds of circumstances. And I wonder if there's been any guidance out of APA on that topic because I haven't seen any, you know, where, where typically it takes a little while to get qualified in for accessibility services. And I don't know if, um, if there's been any work done. We've done a little bit in the, um, the APA FAQ document that I referenced. There's, I think, at least two FAQs um, in there uh, related to students with disabilities. So that's something we can certainly take a look at um, if people feel like there's more that we need to be putting in place there. That would be some great feedback I'd love to get from the group. Thanks, Paula. Just a note, too, we have this whole group of other training directors here, too, so feel free to pose questions to each other about how we're responding to things as well. And if there's questions we don't have uh, great resources for, we're happy to jot those down and try to get you connected to someone else who might have those answers as well. At, at Kent State, the big question right now is what we're going to do about opening. So I'm glad to hear that that's under development. Because July 1st, a lot of the external practicum sites and placements start, and we have no idea what's going to happen. So, Yeah, I think that's going to be really challenging. It's, it's one thing to bring back students that were already part of your training cadre, you had a relationship with, you had training plans in place, but the whole idea of students that are new 
um, to your program uh, that are going out on clinical placements. So ho hopefully that document um, will, be, will be helpful to the training community, and I expect that to be out fairly soon. Just to piggyback a little bit um, uh, off of Paula's question, I'm wondering um, if there has been consideration, you know, we think about typical sort of um, disabilities that need accommodations, but, you know, being immunocompromised is not usually one of those. Or more importantly, I think, uh, or even further afield is needing to be the caregiver for an elderly parent, for example, or somebody else who might be more vulnerable. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we're really struggling with and grappling with. So I'm curious to hear if others have thoughts or, or Kathy, if you do as well, about um, how in acknowledging that power differential, when students don't feel comfortable coming back into a face-to-face -face clinical kind of situation, how we can make accommodations for those students who um, have needs that are different than the typical kind of accommodation situations. It's really easy to sort of say, okay, we need accommodations for this person given this reason they're registered with our student disability services. But I think these more um, sort of uh, indirect, if you will, um, situations are, are giving us a lot of trouble. So I'd be curious to hear how others mm -hmm. are thinking about it. I'm deliberately being quiet to see if anybody else wants to jump in, but if nobody does, I will. <laughs> um, just at Cleveland State, we haven't had students who've requested any type of um, kind of accommodations based on being a caregiver yet. So I would imagine that we would try to work with the individual students, you know, to figure out some sort of solution that they're comfortable with and that also we're comfortable with, if that were the case. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, this all comes down to flexibility and can we be flexible in ways that we never thought we would need to think about being flexible and, and what can you do to, you know, ensure that there's not a significant disruption to that individual's training. Um, but also being mindful of, of the realities of, of the individual circumstances and are there different types of activities that they could engage in that would be safer? Could they do an altered work hours, for example, work certain days? I mean, there, there's lots of ways that we can think creatively, hopefully, to figure out a solution that works for everybody. I think one of the challenges that we're having along these lines, and I don't want to give a lot of details on this call, but, um, you know, clearly someone could take a leave if they can't do program activities. However, we are then talking about potentially taking away health insurance from people who are vulnerable right now, and that's, and that's exactly what's causing the problem. And so it, it's really, this is a big challenge because we're not just talking mm -hmm. about reducing someone's hours or you know, we're, we might be a year or a year and a half before we can let certain people back on face-to-face -face practica. It's, it's a really challenging time. So if there's any guidance about how ADA might apply or what best practices are, I mean, I think we're all trying to do our best, but if there are any ideas, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, yeah, take a look at the document I referenced because we do cite some of the um, ADA things. But I think, you know, one of the challenges is that, you know, a lot of our thinking was, uh, okay, training is going to be disrupted for the spring semester or, or a month or two months. And, you know, we came up with a lot of good thinking that um, was good thinking under, under those premises. But now that it, it's, you know, becoming clearer and clearer, this, this is a long-term event. I think that's one area where we need to be thinking um, more about what we could be giving for guidance. If it's going to be more than a couple months, then you, you don't have the opportunity per se to, to help the student build those competencies, which is the goal um, of the clinical training. And you can do it much more creatively for a month, you know, having them, you know, rewrite test reports, on, uh, you know, data that you have or watch a CE thing on a particular treatment thing, but that's not going to work for 
an extended period of time. So I'll take some notes on that, yeah. One of the other issues that students have been um, bringing up as they've asked or looked forward to their practica for next year, which may or may not start, is some practica lend themselves to um, being able to be done remotely and then some do not. Obviously, telehealth is not really an option with many assessment practica. So we have some inconsistency across um, students and there's a, a sort of a fairness perception and those students who are doing more assessment um, are much more, it seems at least some of them have been much more anxious to go back to in-person and in ways that I, I worry that could put them um, at risk. But there is this unequal experience where it feels like some practicum sites have been able to shift to telehealth so the students have continued to accrue hours and they're fine and other students have basically ground to a halt and they can't do that. And I'm wondering, is there any um, thoughts about that or guidance on how to make it be equitable so that this doesn't feel like it's, it's more, um, uh, it's, it's a harder burden for some students given their interests or just where they had matched for a practicum versus other students. And I'd be curious if others on the call could, could help respond to you because I'm sure other people have experienced the same thing, but I, I'll, I'll tell you afterwards about something I'm involved in that might be helpful. I know several others had submitted a similar question around assessment right now, so certainly looking to hear from how others are handling it. I don't have any input on the assessment piece of things, but I can also say that some of my <clears throat> interns are struggling based on their interests. Um, so I have one who is primarily interested in early childhood, and so they are having struggles with engaging um, young kids on through telehealth means. So um, that's where that kind of disproportionate um, effect happens where some are still getting a good amount of hours and training because it's seamlessly kind of transitioning to telehealth and others are really struggling with it. Hey. I can just comment on that. This is Cindy Van Curen. I'm the president-elect for OPA and we've been trying to do consultation groups for that very reason that we're really trying to to help even licensed psychologists to be able to make that sort of adaptation. So those are recorded. Hopefully that's something that'd be useful as well because we've had specific groups for working with children. We've got one coming up specific for working with the geriatric population who aren't necessarily comfortable with technology and maybe are hard of hearing and, and those struggles. So there are definitely unique challenges beyond those of just getting comfortable with, with the equipment. So I hope that's another helpful resource. So I can jump in. I'm at the very early stages of, of working on uh, a proposal to particularly address some of the issues with practicum students who've had their practicum training uh, disrupted. It doesn't really get at the inequity question that, that you started with, but just in terms of, of continuity of training um, across students. And uh, I've been working with um, several other health professions associations. So like, you know, the American Association of Medical Colleges, the group for nursing colleges, osteopathic medicine, dentistry, and, and they're all experiencing the same thing where their students have had clinical placements disrupted and uh, they've got a, a workforce out there that could be doing things, but they're, they're not doing things because the environments where they would be doing things are just not appropriate for training at this point in time. Um, so, so we're looking at models for how we can take these health profession students and uh, get them into their communities in a safe way, and I emphasize the safe part very much, but uh, to capitalize on some of the skill sets that they have and uh, get them serving their communities. So, for example, uh, with our, our psychology students who uh, certainly would, would be very um, able to provide guidance and, and tips to people on how to take care of stress, how, how to manage your anxiety, how to do things to promote wellness, you know, are there ways that we could, again, safely help them uh, be working in their communities delivering uh, those types of interventions. Um, we are hopefully going to pilot a project starting in uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, very soon 
uh, working with an entity called the Medical Reserve Corps, um, which uh, deploys uh, healthcare workers in times of crisis to uh, provide community level um, services. So, looking for ways that uh, we can create opportunities for health profession students to be serving their communities. Hopefully making those experiences interprofessional where they're working with colleagues from, from other professions as they do these types of things. Um, and I think that would be a win-win where we have students get the opportunity to deliver a valued service that they're learning from at the same time. I, I, if I can go back, I'm still thinking about the comments earlier about some of the uh, rotations or positions loan themselves more readily to telehealth, which is certainly true um, mm -hmm. and challenging some interest. I almost wonder if interests are going to shift a bit in response. Are we going to have fewer people um, wanting to be trained in inpatient or CNL or um, things like that? Uh, I, I'm just curious to see how this plays out because those are obviously still really mm -hmm. important areas, but they don't loan themselves very easily to um, telehealth. That is a very interesting point. Yeah. I, I also hope that, you know, one positive outcome of this awful experience might be that uh, people feel more of a sense of the importance of psychology and what we can provide no matter what the setting it is. But we have so much to offer. Um, in this particular situation, and it's only going to be more and more clear as we move through this, as people are dealing with grief and loss and stress and um, all kinds of uh, different emotional reactions uh, to this pandemic, that um, psychology is, is just well positioned to uh, really help benefit our society. So I hope that it keeps people excited about um, psychology as a profession, although perhaps, as you suggest, they might uh, end up wanting to practice in different types of settings. I think one of the other issues that might be connected to the issue of inequity is right there are two pieces. One is the lack of those actual training opportunities in getting the experiences. But I can say honestly from some of my students, there's also the fear that some students are getting hours and I'm not getting hours. Um, and so separating out the issue of the quality of the experience from the quantity. And I know for years, internship training directors, I'm at a, a doctoral program and internship training directors have done a wonderful job saying it's about the quality, not the quantity. It's about the quality, mm -hmm. not the quantity. But I'm wondering if that message can get amplified a little bit more, um, potentially from the internship training community in some sort of formal way, where I've been trying to tell my students that there's going to be a new normal. Everyone expects that no one's going to have the same hours in the next couple of years of applying out that other people did. Everybody's losing hours. But I wonder if there's also some fear that people are, quote unquote, losing hours at a disproportionate or, or in, in a in a way that's not equitable in some way. Um, in addition to all the great comments about um, how do we make sure students are getting the right kinds of training opportunities um, at this time. Yeah, I think that comment is spot on. And I, I've heard from other training directors that they're getting really creative and, and looking at ways that their students can do things during this point in time that will um, show that they're developing clinical competence that might um, be able to be reflected on the API. But um, I know APIC has, has been out there trying to, to make pretty clear statements of it's about the competence and not about the hours. Um, the, the other question I'm surprised hasn't come up yet is, is the only place where hours um, really seem to be a potential sticking point is, is with licensing um, moving forward. And that's something that um, we definitely have on our radar um, as, as a short and long term uh, potential problem um, for, for our psychology students. And um, I just would mention that um, the Association of State and Provincial Psychology Boards, the, the organization that brings together uh, most of the, the licensure boards in the United States and Canada, um, they have this on their radar um, as well as one of many issues that, that they're working on with their, their member boards. But um, really understanding that we're going to need to apply flexibility in ways that we never thought flexibility would be warranted, and that includes, you know, with the licensure process, and uh, they, they have made a commitment. They've actually started a task force to uh, come up with some recommendations for how states can 
uh, look at their licensing rules and regulations and make sure that they're, they're not impediments for, for students to get licensed that don't need to be there as a result of the pandemic. I know one of the other questions that showed up a lot is around orienting. I think as we're gearing towards the next incoming years, I saw a lot of questions about either orienting people to academic programs or to internship sites. So just wondering what, how other people are being creative and what recommendations there might be. Well, I'm certainly hoping that my incoming cohort can uh, show up in August and that we can get started, but I don't know what's going to happen. I've been reaching out to people by email and we're going to use a Zoom meeting. And I'm going to do some study of what onboarding actually is according to the industrial organizational psychology literature and maybe provide some guidance in the ways that I like to do on a podcast, something about, you know, here's how you onboard and you may have to take onboarding personally this year because you may not have a lot of support from the uh, university at large to get ready to be a graduate student. For our program in Cleveland, um, we're expecting to do a lot of our hospital orientation for our internship and um, uh, through through our program, it's usually the first two weeks of the program is orientation and we're expecting to do a lot of that by remote and zoom meetings just planning for the worst but hoping that we'll be able to be, bring people in. Um, I think where we're struggling is we do a lot of, of in person observation of our trainees at the beginning to assess their competencies before we kind of turn them loose. And I think that's where we're trying to figure out how to balance whether we're going to use more simulations and things like that to determine level of competence when they enter the program. Um, I'm sure we're going to be continuing to do telehealth um, interventions as we go forward, even if we're able to return to face-to-face. -face. Our hospital has indicated they, they want to keep that as, a, as um, an opportunity for us to grow. So I will be doing some sort of combination of face-to-face -face and telehealth, but we're not sure what percentage that is. And we're trying to uh, make sure we're providing adequate supervision to our trainees as they go off to do their clinical work, particularly since we do integrated primary care. And one of the important components of that is building your team and the relationship with the physicians. And when they're not there with those medical residents, we want to make sure that we have a way for them to develop that team connection with, their, with the uh, continuity clinics they're working with, too. So those are things that we've been thinking about and working on. Is, any, is anybody in Ohio going to be requiring incoming students or interns to quarantine for two weeks, which would mean they have to show up and live in the state for two weeks before they can start? We were actually just talking about that in Cincinnati because um, I think it partly depends on what the governor's orders are at that point in time, right? Um, so I don't see how we can not follow whatever the shelter in place orders are that are in place. Simultaneously though, I've been watching the discussion on the CUD Cup listserv with APIC about how it's problematic to require people to come extra early and, pay, and have expense related to that. So I feel like we're a little bit between a rock and a hard place on that. Our agency policy at present is that they would have to do that. Um, some of our interns have gone back to their homes um, and are continuing telehealth services from their homes. And so we're kind of struggling with them needing to plan out when they come back, when they can come back so that they can get their belongings and everything. Um, and the end of our training year is June 30th. So it's approaching Soon, so we have to start making those decisions about when they come back and when it's safe for them to come back into the office. So it's been tough.
if I can go back to something um, just a moment ago that was shared, I'm really stuck on that idea of how do you connect with your team when you maybe can't meet them in person, or at least not in the foreseeable future. I actually really like that idea, and I would like to maybe put together a consultation group um, kind of at the change of the academic year where I think we could just make ourselves available to consult on that. I know my team has gone from, even though we're all in the same building, we don't meet in person anymore because we can't have more than 10 people in a room. Um, so I, I would love to put something together like that if, if folks think it would be useful and, and we can make that available uh, to anybody that's interested in attending. I think that would be great. So about 250 universities now have a hiring freeze in America, and maybe more by now. And I'm wondering what's going to happen to people coming off of internship in terms of are there going to be postdocs or job opportunities? Um, it feels like we might be about to fall off an uh, employment cliff in psychology, and I'm wondering if APA is thinking about that. Very much. Uh, for our new graduates, for our current faculty, I mean, you know, you read the articles every day. It's hitting all sectors of the country, including um, academic institutions. So um, that is certainly something that you know we're concerned about and have on our radar. Um, one of the webinars that we have coming up for um, those who will be hitting the job market soon is, is how to best market yourself in, in this environment and uh, sharing some tips uh, for people to make themselves look um, very competitive because I, I do think uh, positions will necessarily shrink because we just you know, people don't have the money to do that. I, I have a similar concern too about um, increasing bottlenecks at the input end to a graduate programs. Um, with all the budget cuts, I think we just are probably going to be looking at fewer slots in the next year or two because of poor ability to support people. Um, and I hate to even think about that because it's already so disgustingly competitive to get into clinical psychology. But I, I kind of see that also that there's probably going to be smaller programs and maybe even some years skipped in admissions because of this. I actually have been worrying about the opposite that programs that are um, that do not have much of the experience focus that are more of a professional program because of the strains on university budget administration is going to view those that have been able to have cohorts stay small and be selective are they going to put pressure on to um, expand significantly the amount of students that are in accepted as a way to be able to generate um, revenue and given the needs for the faculty to student ratios you know, that's not something that programs can absorb or can do and, and keep accreditation right. And certainly we've not heard anything like that at all at this point yet, but thinking down the road, programs that provide strong financial support for students are going to likely narrow, but those that are, um, that don't provide as much financial support might feel some pressure to expand. And then how will the accreditation bodies view that? And yet yeah, you have even potentially a, a we have some potential divergence between these programs that I think in the new standards of accreditation, there's been some effort to more standardize program degree type to say these are the essential elements of training and that this differential enrollment could really kind of disrupt that, that greater standardization. Interesting proposition you lay out there. Um, I can see that potentially being the case that we would have um, a bimodal distribution moving forward. I mean, certainly we've always had variations in sizes of, of programs out there. So I think to a certain extent, you'd say that the standards um, have been developed to, to capture both the breadth of our field, but also in recognition of, of some of the challenges, particularly within uh, larger programs and how best to meet the needs of individual students. But um, conversely, you could also say if a program was getting much smaller, you know, uh, what, what are some of the downsides of that in terms of the student experience moving 
board in a much smaller cohort than they might have. And I'm sorry, Dr. Grass, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Yeah, I know. Um, one muted. of the people. Yeah, that? Our, people that aren't muted, if you could mute, I don't have the power to do that right now, but we're getting quite a bit of background noise. That would be helpful. Thank you. There we go. Sorry. Go ahead. Did we lose you, Dr. Grass? Let me try to see what we can do here. I've got to... We'll try to get her voice back. Dr. Gross, I know you were using audio through one of your phones. The two phone numbers I have here are both uh, marked as muted right now. Hmm. Okay, you just unmuted me. <laughs> Does that work? All right. Yeah, yeah. Good. All right, thank you. That's always my worst nightmare is to fade out in the middle of a call. <laughs> hey, we managed. Oh. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I was just, you know, mentioning that, you know, variation and the, the cohort size and doctoral programs is not something that our accreditation folks are unfamiliar with. Um, uh, but, you know, would we see greater disparity between, you know, the sizes of programs moving forward because of financial considerations? I suppose that's, that's possible to do so. Um, I, I think our, our standards, um, I think, would continue to, to play and work well for that. But I just would, would worry about the experience for students at both ends of that, that continuum. What is it like to be in a much smaller cohort than typically you'd be in? And, Conversely, for students who might bounce by themselves in a much larger cohort, so you can just see what it's at. And then does that change um, the nature of the student experience? Another question several people have brought up was the idea, like questions around the provision of supervision via tele, whatever it might be. I wonder how people are navigating that. So we've been um, doing that in a couple of ways. Um, when we first rolled out the telehealth interventions, um, our trainees were working remotely from their own homes and we accidentally discovered that the technology we were using through our electronic medical record actually allowed the supervisor to sit in on the trainee's video call. Um, so we could actually be in there and watch them manage a telehealth session um, in real time, um, which was a very good training both for the supervisors and for our interns um, and for our practicum students as well. And um, so once, once we decided that our trainees were competent and understood the technology and were ready to, to start doing some of those on their own, um, we essentially handle our supervision the way we do primary care, where we have kind of a huddle in the morning where we talk about what their day looks like, a huddle at the middle of the day, checking in if there's any issues, um, and then we touch base at the end of the day. Um, and of course, along the way, the trainee always knows how to get a hold of the supervisor if there's an urgent need. Um, and then we also have our regularly scheduled supervision um, every week as well.
I know at CSU we've been talking about the option of like using kind of three-way Zoom calls as the equivalent of live observation or some of those options of recording as well. I think that the biggest challenge we've had at the doctoral level with that in our program is that um, the COA requirements are for students to have finished a whole year of service provision before they are eligible to do tele-supervision. And we wound up with a bunch of students who had not finished a whole first year, but they were in the middle of treatment with clients who really needed continued treatment. Um, and so we had this clash between what uh, what we would have launched if we were starting from scratch as opposed to where we were in this circumstance. I don't know. I imagine others of us have run into that. But we just, in a couple cases, had basically no choice except to convert to health supervision. And to not follow, you know, I, I really would encourage people to, you know, read very carefully the materials coming from COA about, about you know, the, the need for flexibility, and they understand that um, and at this point in time. And um, if you have questions, you can always call the Office of Program Compensation and Accreditation and kind of think through some of the decisions that, that you're making. But, you know, we do need to, to think about the continuity of the treaty experience, the needs of patient care, and, and, and there are multiple factors that, that play into that. Um, I would suspect that we'll see some additional guidance from, from the commission um, moving forward in, in that area. Because um, again, you know, what they were responding to in, in that particular document was, you know, based on a scenario where, hey, let's all go shelter in place for a month and then this thing's going to be gone and we'll be back to business as usual. And I'm not sure if that's going to be the case. Well, I think we probably have time for one more question here if someone wants to jump in and then we'll wrap up. I had a question kind of back to the hours thing and, and um, APEX requirement. I have a number of interns who were already um, struggling somewhat with, with getting those hours and being up to the 500 out of our 2,000 hour internship, um, that being the percentage that APIC is looking for. And I know we're, um, we're trying to be as flexible as we can, but I'm, I'm curious um, if I could get some ideas from others um, on how, what things maybe you're incorporating or how you're being flexible in this manner. Um, I'm a new training director as well. This is my first year all the way through. so. It's not something I have a ton of experience with, and I want to make sure that I'm making these decisions that are, um, you know, both going to be um, protective of, of the field, but also to um, help um, our trainees and along during this difficult time. With our interns, um, they actually have been able to maintain it. We feared that, but then they've been able to maintain caseload. But in the meantime, we had thought about some options for can we move anything from summer training wise till now so they have more time later to accrue direct hours? Like, can we shift anything so that as caseload would rebuild, they could accrue more hours later on? And we also tried to think about any like creative options for direct hours um, that we might be able to pull them into have them doing more walk-in hours or things like that. Um, not walk-in now, obviously Colin, but. All right, well, thanks for joining in here. I didn't know, Kathy, any ending thoughts as we would wrap up here? all for the opportunity to share my 
share a little time with you and hear a little bit about your experience. I really appreciate the invitation. And, um, thank you again um, as, as educators for what you're doing. As you heard, I'm a former internship director, and, and I can only imagine the decisions that you're being faced with um, as educators broadly. Um, at this point in time. So good luck to all of you, and please feel free to reach out if, if the CBA helps you at ASA. Similarly, um, we are, have a lot of empathy at, here at OPA for all that um, training directors are facing right now and our students in early career are facing. And so we have resources listed on a page directly for the pandemic right now. On, you can link to it off of OPA's main website. Um, so lots of different training resources, links to things APA is doing. Um, so certainly direct you there. Just in terms of our own stress and well-being to our prevention and wellness, team has been hosting meetings at least once weekly that have been a great resource in terms of self-care, adjustment to telehealth, how to stay connected and supporting each other. Um, so that's a great resource as well if you're interested. Um, Cindy, did you want to chime in? Yeah, I just want to add too, you know, I really appreciate the thoughtful discussion here and uh, some ideas I'll share back with OPA leadership and um, I'd love to go ahead and develop some of these consultation groups on how to connect the team, um, how to be the new person when you can't meet anybody in person, uh, some of these unique challenges. I'd like to give some thought to that. I'm very curious about this idea of the new needs for accessibility um, and maybe there's a place for us to do a survey or something along those lines so that we can be thoughtful in providing a helpful response to that as well. And we do have some upcoming webinars on uh, racism during the age of COVID and some other things that I think are going to be important for licensed and uh, trainee folks um, together. So I really appreciate everybody being on the call today and, and keep an eye out for our pandemic resource page on OPA's website. Cool. Well, many thanks to Kathy for joining us here and thanks to you all for hopping on the call. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Kathy. Bye. Bye.